Thank you guys. Got quiet and I didn't have to do anything. <laughs> Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Maya Ghosh, and I am one of your Ath Fellows this year. When President Joe Biden was sworn into office less than a year ago, his administration released a roadmap to having American greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 while stimulating the economy and increasing the use of renewable energy sources. However, Biden's comprehensive plan has come after four years of the Trump administration, which undid long-standing environmental regulations. The administrative oscillation in environmental policy generates pressing questions about the state of the climate change legislation in America. How should it be enacted? Will it appeal to all Americans? And what will and won't come to fruition? Tonight, Roger Carapin, professor of political science at City University of New York's Graduate Center and author of Political Opportunities for Climate Policy, California, New York, and the Federal Government, will discuss the Biden administration's climate policies in light of the Obama and Trump administration policies, as well as the constraints and opportunities presented by the current political situation. Professor Carapin has been widely published on climate change policy and renewable energy policy in the United States, Germany, and Canada. His book, Political Opportunities for Climate Change, California, New York, and the Federal Government, won the Caldwell Prize for Best Book on Environmental Politics and Policy, awarded by the American Political Science Association. Now, before we begin, just a few reminders. Please remember to keep your mask on for the duration of the program indoors. If you'd like to take a sip of water, please step outside the Eggert dining room to do so. Second, audio and visual recording are strictly prohibited. Please take a moment to silence your cell phones. And finally, please remember to take a deep breath and remember to be present in the space. Now, please join me in wel welcoming Professor Carapin to the Athenaeum. Thank you, Maya, for that introduction, and thank you all for coming here for this presentation. Uh, please bear with me for a few seconds while I dig my notes out of my bag. Oh, good, they're here. <laughs> so today I'll be talking about climate change policy in the Biden administration with some background about the Trump I'm sorry, the Obama and Trump administrations. In 2016, I wrote a book about U.S. climate policy that went through the end of the Obama administration. Uh, and then we had four surprising years in politics, as you know, and which involved a retreat from national climate policy in this country. So I'm glad to be able to give a talk to you today about further progress uh, in climate policy at the national level. My focus here is on climate change mitigation policy, not adaptation policy. Mitigation policy means prevention. It means uh, anything that reduces net greenhouse gas emissions. For example, by developing wind or solar power or promoting electric vehicles or requiring oil and gas companies to plug methane leaks. Uh, so first I want to give some context to, to help understand where we are, uh, how we got here, and where we're likely to go. Uh, for one thing, it's now widely recognized in the United States that uh, anthropocentric climate change is a serious public problem. In the last five years, it's been widely reported in the news, as you can see here. Uh, this is U.S. newspaper data from 2000 to August of 2021. Uh, for three of the newspapers, the New York Times, Washington Post, and the LA Times, it shows a big increase uh, in the 2007-2009 area. Uh, that was related to the uh, Obama administration's policies. And then again, pretty much a, a, a large um, plateau uh, after 2015, or a high level since 2015. And there's a similar pattern in TV coverage, uh, especially on cable news. So there's a high degree of public and elite awareness or attention on the issue. Uh, and on top of that, uh, a majority of the public now sees uh, global warming as being caused by human beings and as having consequences that are already being felt today. Um, you can see this on the Gallup data that goes back to 2001. Uh, the first two lines describe what I was just talking about, and now over 60% of the public believe that 
uh, global warming is caused by people and uh, the effects have already begun. Uh, this risen substantially since 2008 recession uh, and it's only come down a little bit, if at all, uh, since the pandemic and the recession that, that it induced. So in spite of these features of our political situation, uh, the U.S. has relatively weak national level climate policy on the whole compared to West European countries. And this may be puzzling. Uh, it has no legally binding targets. Uh, it has no carbon pricing through emissions trading or a carbon tax. It has no binding renewable energy tar uh, target at the federal level. The Kyoto Protocol was not ratified by the Senate. Uh, it's true that state governments, especially in states governed by the Democratic Party, have compensated to some extent, uh, largely through renewable energy and energy efficiency policies, but also through carbon pricing in California and the northeastern states. Uh, these efforts are very important, but they're not enough to bring the U.S. into line with a contribution to keeping global warming below two degrees or one and a half degrees of, um, of warming. So. Uh, why is federal climate policy so weak? Well, scholars have a basic consensus on the main reasons. Reason number one is that we have large fossil fuel industries that have political clout in Washington. Second, uh, there's a climate science denial movement funded by the fossil fuel industry and by conservative organizations that has had a large impact on elite opinion and on public opinion. Uh, there are also institutional reasons, though. We have a fragmented system of government with many veto points, uh, so it's easy for one party to block policy if it has a majority in either the House or the Senate or the Electoral College or the federal courts. There's also been political shifts, uh, rising party polarization as Republicans have shifted towards strong opposition to climate change policy along with other environmental policy in recent decades. And since 1968, we've had a strong tendency for our government institutions to be divided between the parties rather than to be under the unified control of one of them. So the situation we have today is relatively unusual. Only about 25% of the time does one party control uh, the White House, the House, and the Senate. Uh, so these are structural factors. Structural means that they change only very slowly, if at all. And yet, they, still, they can sometimes be overcome when committed political actors have taken advantage of a window of opportunity. Uh, so the Obama administration did this, and it produced some major changes in federal climate policy. Immediately, there was $85 billion in stimulus spending for energy efficiency and renewable energy. Uh, then the Waxman-Markey bill failed in Congress. This would have created a national cap and trade system and a national renewable portfolio standard. Um, the Obama administration continued, though, with a regulatory approach, a relatively ambitious one, uh, on the basis of the Supreme Court's decision in Mass v. EPA in 2007. So they set ambitious new rules in f three main areas. One was motor vehicles, uh, which is described a bit more in this slide. Uh, the Obama administration nationalized California's policy for cars and light trucks, what was known as the Pavley Bill here, and it did so through deals with the major car makers. It required about a 50% cut in emissions per mile from 2011 to 2025. Uh, this slide shows us in terms of um, fuel efficiency standards, so the y-axis is miles per gallon, so more miles per gallon means less G greenhouse gas emissions per mile. So greater efficiency. Uh, and you can see that the, the standards were flat from around 1982 to about 2010. This is for light cars. Uh, and then uh, increased at a rather rapid uh, linear rate, approximately linear rate since then. So that was uh, vehicles. Power plants was the second area. They were also developed um, greenhouse gas standards there, but with less success. Rules on new power plants were adopted in 2013, uh, effectively meaning no new coal plants unless they had carbon capture and storage technology. Um, and also rules on existing plants, the Clean Power Plan in 2015. Um, it was supposed to be implemented by state governments beginning in 2022, but it was blocked by the Supreme Court early in 2016 uh, and never went into effect. 
The third main area was methane rules. These were adopted in 2016 for the oil and gas industry, requiring them to find and repair leaks and to limit the flaring of methane, uh, and also rules for municipal solid waste la landfills, uh, requiring a one-third reduction. They also issued rules uh, concerning energy efficiency in appliances and equipment, 45 new standards uh, working off a backlog from the Bush administration. And internationally, Obama uh, <coughs> reasserted U.S. leadership, which had lapsed under George W. Bush. He first asserted a 17 percent target <coughs> in the Copenhagen Accords, uh, and then a 26 percent target. Uh, that's a reduction from 2005 to 2025 in the Paris Agreement. Here we go. Uh, this shows you emissions uh, in the dark blue line at the top here. These are actual emissions. Uh, and the red dotted line and the green line are the Copenhagen and Paris uh, the targets and the, uh, the path toward them. So you can see from this graph that the, um, the targets were ambitious, relatively ambitious, but they, were, they seemed to be achievable at the time that they were adopted. Uh, okay, so what can we learn from the Obama administration? Uh, I think there are five lessons. The first is that uh, in the current political environment, many elected officials, most of them Democrats, will make climate change policy a priority. Um, but second, with highly polarized political parties and public opinion, uh, I'm sorry, with po highly polarized parties and often divided government and the filibuster rules in the Senate, uh, Congress is unlikely to pass major climate legislation, as seen by the Waxman-Markey bill. However, Point number three is that even uh, economic crises present opportunities. They make it easier to include clean energy spending in stimulus bills that Congress may pass, since the usual constraints on deficit spending are weaker in a recession. The fourth lesson is that in any case, the executive branch has much scope for unilateral action, uh, for example, by regulating greenhouse gases. Um, because of the Clean Air Act and the Massachusetts v. EPA decision. And yet the fifth lesson is that this scope is limited potentially by the federal courts, uh, as we can see by the fate of the Clean Power Plan. So after Trump was unexpectedly elected president, uh, the Trump administration effect attempted a complete reversal of Obama's policies, and it largely succeeded for five years, I'm sorry, for four years, <laughs> Uh, that was a slip. Uh, uh, internationally, Trump suspended the U.S.'s participation in the Paris Agreement. Uh, it weakened or blocked greenhouse gas regulations uh, in motor vehicles. It weakened the last round of the fuel economy increases. Uh, the EPA also revoked California's authority to set its own vehicle standards and electric vehicle mandates. That decision went into litigation. Uh, in the terms of in power plants, they replaced the clean power uh, plan for existing power plants with what, what they called the Affordable Clean Energy Rule in 2019. Uh, that rule directs states to improve their energy efficiency in their power plants, and it was not expected to lead to any actual reduction in emissions. Uh, in the area of methane, they blocked the regulation of the oil and gas industry and delayed the landfill methane regulations. Uh, they also undermined energy efficiency standards by not updating them uh, or even by rolling back standards for some products. And finally, the Trump administration recalculated the social cost of carbon. That's a figure that is used by federal agencies for cost-benefit analyses. It reduced it from only, uh, from about $45 a ton to only $7 per ton. So there are also lessons from the Trump administration, uh, two main ones. The first is that Republicans are still strongly wedded to the fossil fuel industry and hostile to climate policy along with other environmental policy. And secondly, what a Democratic president can do through executive action can be undone through executive action by a Republican president. And that brings us to Biden's election. Biden's election created a window of opportunity for climate policy, but the size and duration of this window are uncertain. A window of opportunity depends on two things coming together at the same time. Number one is high concern about the problem, 
And number two is a strong political commitment to address it with appropriate policies. Now, both of these elements are present right now, but the indicators of concern and commitment are both somewhat mixed. Concern about the problem is high, but it has to compete with the pandemic and economic recovery for a place on the political agenda and for limited resources, uh, like money or Biden's political, um, political attention and his, his ability to sway people. Um, political commitment is high among Democrats and it's rising among business people. And Democrats have unified control of the presidency and Congress, but they have the tiniest possible congressional majorities and they face a potentially hostile Supreme Court. So I wanna say a little bit more about um, Biden's plans. I think political commitment is clear. I mean, right now we're, we've been seeing for the last month how hard Biden has been trying to get climate policy legislation included in, uh, and passed by Congress. Uh, we see that he's in Glasgow right now uh, at COP26. Um, so it's clear that climate change is a high priority for him. Um, and I wanna say a little bit about now about his specific, more specific plans. First, some overall features of these plans. There are four of them that depart at least somewhat from the policy of the Obama administration. Uh, number one, as I mentioned, ambitious goals for greenhouse gas reduction, uh, mostly through clean energy and energy efficiency policies. There's an overarching goal of <coughs> US net zero emissions by 2050. Uh, the interim target was announced at the International Climate Summit in April, a 50% cut by 2030 compared to 2005. Uh, and there's also a target for the electricity sector, which is supposed to be carbon free by 2035, and for, the s for solar uh, as a share of electricity generation, which is supposed to be up to 45% by 2050. So I'm gonna move forward to a slide here that shows you those targets in comparison to the Obama administration's targets. So, uh, Biden's targets are in the, the dark blue line here, uh, or darker, sorry, light blue, I guess, compared to the earlier other line here, which is actual emissions. So a lighter blue line and the light green line here. And so uh, what you can see here is that uh, the angle of decline is substantially greater than it was uh, for the Obama administration's targets. So there's, the ambition has really increased. Go back. So ambitious goals is the first main feature. Secondly, green growth. Uh, the whole plan is premised on green growth. Uh, it doesn't pit the economy against the environment. Rather, it tries to find ways for the transition to clean energy to create jobs and to spur economic growth. Third, there is synergy with other Democratic Party priorities. Workers in disadvantaged communities are especially to benefit from these climate policies. Uh, the Biden administration focuses on co-benefits for health and jobs, not just on the in direct environmental benefits. And fourth, Biden is taking a whole of government approach, uh, which means that all major agencies and departments are supposed to be involved in climate policy development and implementation. Now, although Biden's plans are ambitious and comprehensive, they also have three major shortcomings. Uh, one is that there weren't sectoral targets other than for electricity. So big, big headline target of neutrality by 2050, but uh, no information about what the other sectors, how the sectors should get there. Um, secondly, the enforcement mechanism for these targets was vaguely stated in his campaign plans, and he hasn't come back to it. He seemed to be implying the need for carbon pricing, but has not advanced a carbon pricing plan. Uh, and finally, much of his plans uh, depend on congressional actions, which is very uncertain. Next, I wanna talk about his policies and executive orders and congressional proposal proposals in many specific areas, just briefly, uh, before looking at his strategies. So, <coughs> he has detailed plans in a wide variety of areas. He had them during the campaign and they've been fleshed out further. Uh, in the electricity area, he wanted a clean electricity standard, uh, and then that morphed into a clean electricity performance plan um, for utilities and grid operators. He wants to, to reform and extend energy efficiency and renewable energy tax incentives to make major investments in grid modernization 
and to expand offshore wind. In terms of transportation infrastructure, he wants major investments in mass transit, railroads, high-speed broadband. In buildings, he wants money for energy efficiency improvements in homes and commercial buildings and school, uh, and and school buildings. Uh, in the uh, uh, he w in terms of energy efficiency in appliances and equipment, he wants many new standards. Uh, in vehicles, he wants more ambitious fuel economy standards, and he wants the U.S. to make a major effort regarding electric vehicles, including a network of charging outlets, electric vehicle tax credits, and federal purchasing of clean vehicles to help to jump sp start the electric vehicle market, including vehicles for the Postal Service. He also wants a large increase in clean energy R research and development spending on battery storage, advanced nuclear, refrigerants, buildings, hydrogen fuel cells, carbon capture and storage, floating offshore wind, biofuels, and electric vehicles. In the financial sector, Biden wants uh, the government to require public companies to disclose climate risks and greenhouse gas emissions in their supply chains in order to help to steer investors' decisions. According to the plans, fossil fuel fuels are to be curbed um, through methane regulations for the oil and gas industry, through an end to fossil fuel subsidies, and to an end to le leasing for oil and gas on federal lands, including the Arctic. And to aid the transition away from fossil fuels, he wants Congress to appropriate money to plug old oil and gas wells, to reclaim coal mines, and to create jobs in doing so and to make investments in coal and power plant communities to help to compensate some of these losers of the energy transition. On nuclear energy, the administration is lukewarm. Uh, the, the campaign documents said th that we need to identify its future by looking at cost, safety, and waste disposal issues, but nuclear power has been included in the Clean Energy Performance Plan and in the research and development spending. Internationally, Biden wanted the U.S. back on the Cl Paris Agreement. He wants the U.S. to take a leading role to contribute to the Green, green Climate Fund. And he's open to using import taxes potentially as leverage. He calls them carbon adjustment fees. Uh, it's also interesting to see what's not in his plans. There's no ban on fracking or on new pipelines. Uh, there's no 100 percent renewable energy target. Uh, rather, nuclear and CCS are part of the proposed solution. And there's no carbon tax or emissions trading system. So plans are good, um, but to achieve them requires a political strategy. Uh, and overall, the Biden administration is pursuing two main strategies. Uh, the first is executive action, without congressional approval needed. The first of these is the whole of government approach. Um, to embed climate policy in all the major departments, uh, Biden appointed people that support a strong push for climate policy and have a lot of experience in this area. Uh, Michael Regan as the EPA head, uh, Gina McCarthy as a domestic climate advisor, John Kerry as the international climate envoy, uh, and so on. Second, an initial task for Biden has been to undo Trump's rollback of the Obama-era regulations. Uh, and much of this is already initiated uh, through executive orders in January of this year. Uh, rules on methane, fuel economy, appliance and building energy efficiency, and on coal plants will all be reviewed um, by the EPA. Uh, Biden revokes Trump's executive order ordering the federal agencies to promote fossil fuel development. Uh, and the administration has intervened in ongoing litigation that was provoked by the Trump administration's policies, especially on vehicles and power plants. Um, as part of this whole of government approach, Biden also, Biden also issued uh, executive orders creating new policy-making structures, a special envoy for international climate policy, a White House Office of Domestic Climate Policy, an interagency working group on coal and power plant communities, uh, a similar group on the social costs of greenhouse gases. Biden ordered the Na Director of National Intelligence to prepare uh, a national intelligence estimate about the national security implications of climate change. Uh, he created a White House Inter Environmental Justice Interagency Council and a similar council inside the EPA. So he created many new organizations to implement his whole-of-government approach, 
They all, many of them face a problem though. A lot of staff were lost under Trump, especially scientific staff at the EPA and the U.S. Geological Survey. And career scientists are reluctant to take jobs in the federal government again due to the politicization of science under Trump. So Biden has quickly issued executive orders in many areas, but to be durable, regulations are required, and those need to go through a rulemaking process that takes several years. So here I go. Um, so uh, first and foremost, these concern greenhouse gas emissions, um, vehicles, methane, appliances, infrastructure. New rules are going to come out or already have come out of the review of the Trump administration's rules. Uh, in the energy sector, there are also uh, plans to develop rules on offshore wind permitting and development uh, on federal land and waters, also rules on fossil fuel development. In the financial area, new rules um, have been ordered to be produced on business disclosures of climate risks from the Securities and Exchange Commission. In terms of purchasing by federal government, um, for especially electric vehicles and batteries and energy efficiency and government policy. Um, the administration is also able to repurpose existing grant and loan funds, uh, transportation grants and loans by the Department of Transportation, and the Department of Energy has clean energy loans that are left over from the Obama administration, $40 billion that wasn't lent out by the Trump administration. Uh, and finally, most of the foreign policy measures that Biden is planning can be done without congressional approval. Uh, so. Other things would require congressional approval, um, especially the $550 billion infrastructure bill and the $3.5 trillion initially budget bill. Now it's been pared down to $1.85 trillion. In dealing with Congress, Biden has followed three strategies, um, especially for all this new spending and the tax incentives. The first is to include climate policy measures in broader bills uh, in order to build larger coalitions. Uh, secondly, he's included support for carbon capture and storage and for nuclear power to try to win over Democratic moderates and potentially some Republicans. And the third strategy is to try to use the reconciliation procedure in the Senate, uh, which is currently planned uh, for the House budget bill, uh, since that bill apparently cannot get any Republican support. Now, the, the reconciliation procedure is difficult, not in, but possible. It's difficult because it's, they need to keep all 50 Democratic senators together and they need to get the approval of the Senate parliamentarian uh, for every aspect of the bill to make sure that it, it meets the requirements, uh, which means it has to, has to be uh, mostly about spending or taxing. It has to be its primary purpose. Uh, so Congress is going to resist in some areas more than others. Uh, bipartisan support is clearly possible for building codes reform, for investments in clean energy research, for the phase down of HFCs, um, bipartisan support <coughs> is possible but uncertain for other items, uh, transportation and buildings infrastructure, uh, electricity grid modernization, uh, tax incentives for clean energy adoption, and other things are very difficult. Um, mandatory targets, uh, enforcement mechanism for them such as a carbon price, ending fossil fuel subsidies in the, in the tax code, and uh, <coughs> the clean energy standard even though it included nuclear and coal in, in CCS. So where do things stand now? Well, some things have been completed already. Um, that's the first slide here. Um, the first of these was the December 2020 stimulus bill, which was a, the entire bill was $2.3 trillion, and even though Biden was not yet president, this was really his first climate policy of his administration. Um, it included tax credit extensions for wind and solar, as well as for CCS, <coughs> uh, and new five-year tax credits for offshore wind, uh, including a 30% investment tax credit for products that, was, that would begin at any time in the next five years. Um, it also included renewable, um, sorry, research and devel development spending, $35 billion over five years, um, which represented about a 35% increase in renewable energy R&D spending over the previous budget. And it included an HFC phase-down 
um, an 85 percent cut by the year 2035. And uh, after this bill was passed, EPA worked on creating rules to do this, and they've actually already proposed a final rule uh, to do this phase down. So the December 2020 bill was the first thing completed. Second thing I've briefly mentioned already, executive orders on climate change uh, issued his first day in office and one week later, <coughs> initiating regulatory processes, creating po new policymaking institutions, and uh, affecting government purchasing. The next thing that didn't happen really was the March 2021 pandemic relief bill. This was a $1.9 trillion bill, but it included nothing on climate policy. Um, this was a missed opportunity. Other things that were completed, though, include the first round of regulations in some areas. Um, in electricity, uh, Biden administration has already taken steps to expand offshore wind. Uh, they, they announced a new national target of 30 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030, with the federal government to support this with permitting, port infrastructure, and loans. Uh, and they've already approved the, the wind vineyard wind project, which had been held up for many years. Uh, and this sends a strong signal for investment in other wind parks uh, going forward. Vehicle standards, uh, probably the single most important uh, regulatory change under Biden so far. In August, the EPA announced the restoration of the Obama administration's rules through the model year 2026. Uh, so that model year will now have to have a fleet-wide average of 52 mi miles per gallon compared to a requirement of 44 miles a gallon under Trump. Uh, the EPA has also moved to give California back its right to set its own standards. In the area of methane, uh, Obama's rules have been restored, but not by the EPA. They were restored by Congress um, in June uh, with some Republican support. Uh, Biden is considering further limits um, that go beyond the Obama administration's rules. That's for the oil and gas industry. There's also methane rules for uh, landfills. Uh, the EPA has reinstated the Obama administration's rule as an, after a federal court allowed them to do so. Uh, information is another area where the administration is active. Uh, they've created an environmental justice screening tool with uh, interactive maps, which you can see on the EPA website, uh, ejscreen.epa.gov stroke mapper. Uh, and you can learn a lot about your locality in terms of its environmental problems. Um, and the national intelligence estimate that, that Biden ordered was issued last month um, by the Director of National Intelligence. Internationally, of course, Biden's been quite active. The U.S. is back in the Paris Agreement as of February. They announced the new nationally determined contribution, the target of 50 percent by 2030. Uh, they've been trying to take a leading role in pressing other countries uh, for more greenhouse gas reductions. Uh, there was a climate summit online in April with 40 world leaders representing 80 percent of emissions. Uh, right now, the, the, the Glasgow COP2 meetings. Um, and um, yes, so. Other things have been blocked or are still pending. Um, one item has been blocked already, which is the ban on leasing on federal lands. Um, Biden expressed this as a pause rather than a, um, a ban, um, reflecting the uncertain legislative authority that he had to take this action. And it was, a, it was quickly blocked by a federal court in Louisiana in June um, so that these leases are, are re supposed to resume in, uh, last month in October. Um, Pending, there's quite a lot still pending. Uh, the main two things are the infrastructure bill and the budget bill. Uh, infrastructure bill was first called the American Jobs Plan, $2.3 trillion. It was passed by the Senate in August with a different name, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, and a much smaller price tag, $550 billion. Uh, but it still includes some major climate policy measures, including $65 billion for grid modernization, Three and a half billion dollars for buildings, for home weatherization, commercial, school, and federal buildings. Um, Thirty-nine billion to modernize existing mass transit systems. Sixty-six billion for Amtrak. Um, Fifteen billion for electric vehicle charging stations and electric electric buses and ferries. 
uh, 65 billion for high-speed broadband, uh, and some money to transition away from fossil fuels. 16 billion for to plug old oil and gas wells and reclaim coal mines. Uh, 15 billion for CCS and CO2 pipelines. Uh, 750 million dollars for investments in coal and power plant communities. In terms of environmental justice, Biden wanted 40 percent of the clean energy and infrastructure spending to be benefit disadvantaged communities, uh, but this is the case only in a few areas of the Senate bill, um, like electric vehicle charging and water infrastructure and freight. Uh, the main thing, though, is uh, safe drinking water, 55 billion dollars for safe drinking water. In terms of labor provisions, almost all the spending in the infrastructure bill is covered by the Davis-Bacon Act, which requires prevailing wages to be paid on um, these projects. So that's the infrastructure bill. Uh, that was passed by the Senate as awaiting action in the House. Uh, then there's the budget bill, the Build Back Better Act. Initially was proposed uh, at three and a half trillion dollars. It's been scaled back to most recently 1.85 trillion. Uh, this is being considered by the House. It has not yet been passed by the Senate. And uh, it's not clear what can pass the House and also be passed by the Senate. This bill is very much in flux. It used to include a lot of uh, provisions for uh, renewable energy tax credits, uh, 10 years worth of production tax credit extension, uh, also tax credits for CCS, um, more money for electric vehicle charging stations, uh, and for consumer tax credits, that's definitely still in the bill. Uh, very generous ones there. Federal purchasing of clean vehicles, more energy research and development spending, and reduction or ending of many fossil fuel subsidies. Um, so we'll have to see if and when a bill ever passes the House, how much of that still is in there. Uh, also pending is regulation, regulatory changes in vehicles, tougher rules for the post-2026 uh, period are in development. Uh, also rules for medium and heavy duty trucks. Um, and a second round of methane regulation is expected. In terms of uh, financial disclosures, new SEC rules are expected by the end of this year, uh, proposed, proposed rules. Uh, they've been collecting comments in the meantime. Um, and finally, internationally, there's still things ongoing uh, besides COP26. The the administration is promoting the Global Methane Pledge uh, e e together with the European Union to try to get countries on board to cut their methane emissions by 30 percent over the next 10 years. So in all of this activity, it's evident that the Biden administration is um, confronting some constraints <coughs> on what it can do and even on what it can try to do. First, there's a very crowded issue agenda. The pandemic and economic recovery have taken priority for the administration's attention and the use of its political capital. Uh, major problems in these areas still remain, of course, overcoming vaccine resistance, dealing with the current and next wave of cases, managing a rapid economic recovery without too much inflation. Um, and this is, I think, why there was um, no climate spending or tax measures in the March uh, stimulus bill. <coughs> Presumably Biden decided it wasn't worth risking uh, a possible slowdown in the passage of that bill um, by trying to put in more contentious measures about climate change. Um, so the issue agenda is crowded, but the infrastructure bill is still high on the House's agenda, along with the budget bill. Uh, yet when we think about the agenda, it's important to realize that climate change is never the top issue for voters as a whole. And I'm going to show you some data about that. Um, sorry if this is hard to read in the back of the room, but I'll narrate it a little bit. Uh, these are voter priorities in April of 2021 um, from Pew Research Center. And the question that's asked here is, which of the f is each of the following issues uh, a very big problem, a moderately big problem, a small problem, or not, or not a problem at all? And uh, the takeaway from this slide is that climate change is pretty far down. It's uh, issue n it's 10th out of 15 issues. Only 40 percent consider it to be a very big problem, uh, with <coughs> larger percentages naming 
a number of other problems, including health care affordability, federal budget deficit, violent crime, uh, and so on. So um, climate change is not high on people's list, and it never is um, nationally. It's um, just one of many problems, and even if you ask people the primary en environmental issue, it's not usually the top one there either. Um, so on top of that, in times of economic trouble, uh, the economy takes more priority for voters relative to the environment. Um, so you can see that in this data series, uh, which goes from 1985 to 2021. Uh, the um, environment, the priority people put on the environment is shown in the green line up here. So if you put more priority there, you're, you're counted here. And if you put more priority on the economy, you're counted here in the blue line. And <coughs> there's been a general pattern for the economy to become more important over time and the environment less since 1985. But um, what I want to call your attention to is that the last time we had a recession in 2008, 2009, the uh, priority people put on the environment went down notably, and the priority put on the economy went up notably. Uh, and the same trend has happened since the pandemic, as the economy first went into recession, and now it's recovering, but uh, with a strong inflationary tendency. Uh, so uh, priority on environmental issues has gone down. And this, this relates to the, the general background fact that there's a perceived trade-off between environmental policy and economic performance. Whether there really is a trade-off is another matter, but there's a perceived trade-off between those two things. Now, although the public places a low priority on the issue, climate change is a priority for the Biden administration and for Congress uh, for two reasons I'm gonna talk about shortly. Climate change policy is a high priority for Democratic Party voters and it's increasingly so for business. But first, the next, some more constraints. Um, the budget deficit concerns have risen in the last year or so um, about spending and tax incentives, which is a large part of, of U.S. climate policy. Uh, because of the recent increase in inflation and because of the size of, of the deficits, the U.S. federal government's been running unprecedented deficits, at least since the Second World War, unprecedented due to the pandemic, um, about 10 to 15 percent of GDP. Um, and deficit concerns sharply limited the size of the infrastructure bill and the House budget bill. So to avoid deficits, tax increases are necessary, but Democrats have differences on tax increases that will make the House budget bill uh, harder to pass. Third constraint is congressional Republicans. Um, Given partisan polarization and the filibuster rules for the minority in the Senate, uh, environmental issues are, are highly polarized in Congress. Uh, the uh, data I'm going to show you next is from the League of Conservation Voters, uh, which shows that we're at the high, almost the highest level of polarization that we've been at, at since 1970. As Democrats have become more liberal on environmental issues and Republicans more conservative um, in Congress. So. Um, it's also one of the most polarized issues for voters. Uh, on this slide, it's again from that Pew survey in April of 2021, issues are ranked according to how far apart Democrats and Republicans are. So the top issue is gun violence, uh, but climate change is in fourth place because 61% of Democrats, but only 14% of Republicans think that climate change is a very big problem in the country today. So that makes it the fifth biggest issue for Democratic Party voters uh, and helps explain, actually helps explain why um, Democratic politicians have embraced the issue in the last few years. Uh, so Republican opposition is a constraint. Uh, it may not matter very much if um, reconciliation is used to pass the House budget bill, um, but reconciliation leads to the fourth constraint, which is conservative Democrats in Congress. Um, given that they have the narrowest possible Senate majority, 51 to 50, and also a quite very small majority in the House, uh, the most conservative members of Congress, especially in the Senate, will limit the Biden administration on any major climate legislation and spending bills, even if reconciliation is used. 
um, and also on any attempt to abolish the filibuster for that matter. Uh, in particular, Joe Manchin wants only a one and a half trillion dollar spending bill and just today he announced his dissatisfaction with how the House Democrats are counting up the numbers uh, in coming up with a $1.85 trillion bill. He thinks they're understating the actual cost of the legislation. He also wanted a smaller corporate tax increase than Biden did. He vetoed the Clean Energy Performance Plan last month. Uh, so the reconciliation pro process gives him and Kristen Sinema a lot of power in the legislative process. Um, and at, at best, there'll be a, a great dilution, an enormous dilution of the legislation and uh, at worst, the, an inability for it to pass at all. Um, Finally, the federal courts will also limit Biden's regulatory efforts. The conservative ju justices are generally hostile toward administrative power, such as that exercised by the EPA. Uh, and now there's a six to three conservative majority on the Supreme Court. Roberts is no longer the swing vote. Um, a federal judge in Louisiana has already blocked the oil and gas lease pause. Um, so there's a lot of uncertainty about the fate of greenhouse gas regulations. And I think the outcome will depend on three things. Um, one is how ambitious the new standards are. Two is how carefully they're crafted using economic and other rationales. Um, and three is how much business opposition develops to them. So there are important constraints, uh, but there are also some potential drivers, uh, things that might promote climate policy during the next four years. And in particular, much of business has continued to shift toward promoting or accepting a variety of climate policies. And businesses may have one or more of several different motives. Uh, they may prefer one national regulatory approach rather than diverse state regulations. This is true in a lot of areas where state governments have been regulating. Vehicles, clean electricity standards, appliance standards, building codes. Uh, Another motivation, though, is that they may already need to meet the standards in other countries, especially those in the European Union, and therefore would gain an advantage on competitors if the U.S. adopted stricter standards. Um, another motivation is that they, might, they may feel that policy is going to pass regardless of what they do, and they'd rather shape policy than have it imposed upon them. Or they may merely want to have a green reputation in order to attract workers and customers. Uh, there are many examples of this business shift in important sectors. Uh, on HFCs, the manufacturers of HFCs wanted the phase down passed by Congress uh, last December. Um, they thought it was inevitable and they were already facing a similar uh, regulation in the European Union. In electricity, many utilities have supported a clean electricity standard. Um, the Edison Electric Institute and the big utilities were cautiously supportive of the Clean Energy Performance Plan, uh, especially since it included nuclear power and hydroelectric. Uh, Edison hoped to get a partial credit for natural gas out of that. Uh, part of the reason for their approach is that they face regulation already at the state level, but also because um, wind and solar cost, uh, costs have fallen dramatically. So now, at this point in time, new renewable energy plants are competitive with new natural gas plants and cheaper than coal and nuclear plants. Uh, what you can see here is that solar used to be the most expensive. Uh, and wind was the second most expensive uh, form of uh, electricity generation if you were building a new plant. Uh, and now they are the two least expensive methods with uh, natural gas combined cycle uh, as being the third. Uh, coal and nuclear are much more expensive for new plants. Uh, so these estimates um, are, by the way, without subsidies from government. Um, and to, what they mean is that to a large extent, this price difference is going to drive the United States toward renewable energy, uh, more, of re more renewables and less fossil fuels, even without uh, federal government action, but federal government action can accelerate that uh, transition. So back on the drivers, I um, want to mention a few more sectors. Car industry has been changing. Uh, Tesla has grown enormously in value, at least. Uh, GM and Ford have been moving sharply toward electric vehicles since the election. Um, the industry, a couple months ago, accepted the Biden administration's new vehicle standards, uh, and the th three major car makers and the UAW announced 
that they support a 40 to 50 percent electric vehicle share of market share by, um, by 2030. In natural gas, Exxon, Shell, and BP actually opposed the Trump administration's methane regulatory rollback. Uh, they got their trade association, the American Petroleum Institute, so to support methane regulation now. They want to argue that natural gas is a clean fuel. Uh, the oil industry has gone further to actually now um, argue for a carbon price. Um, Exxon, Chevron, and the API. Um, Exxon partly because it's promoting a huge carbon capture and storage project on the Texas Gulf, Texas Gulf Coast, costing $100 billion in its plans. Um, Exxon and Chevron are also under pressure from activist shareholders to shift toward clean energy production, uh, especially the group called Engine Number no. 1. In the banking sector, sector uh, there's also been a lot of activity recently. Eleven trade associations created a group called the Climate Finance Working Group. Uh, and their list of principles this year includes uh, carbon pricing and policies to promote low carbon innovation. Uh, three quarters of the comments on the SEC's climate disclosure plans have been positive so far. So why has business been shifting uh, recently toward accepting climate policy? Well, it's because of large trends that are independent of which party controls the U.S. government. Uh, one of these trends is that there are strong climate policies in many U.S. states and in many countries of the European Union. Uh, secondly, there's technological change, which has been making low-carbon solutions less expensive. Uh, and third, there's momentum that's caused by long-term investments in low-carbon technologies. There are other potential drivers, too. Climate events, like wildfires or flooding, uh, play some role in raising awareness. And international events also raise attention, such as the Glasgow uh, Conference right now. So in conclusion, while Biden is certainly constrained by Congress, there's much that he can do through executive actions. And, through, and although the lessons from the Trump administration suggest that those actions may be overturned by the next Republican administration or by the federal courts, I think the situation is more hopeful than that suggests because there are other sources of progress that help to stabilize the U.S. climate policies, policy, climate policies of state governments in other countries, and business investments in low-carbon technologies. So thank you for listening. I'll be happy to take your questions and comments now. Thank you so much, Professor. We'll now move into the Q&A portion of the evening. If you have a question, please raise your hand, and Maya and I will come to you with the mic. And also, please, um, well, before you ask your question, please introduce yourself, name, major, college year. Hi, uh, my name is Adarsh. I'm a sophomore at CMC, hopefully an environment, economics, politics major. I wanted to get your thoughts on a possible bipartisan approach to a carbon tax, because I know in recent years, the carbon tax model has been adopted by several former Republican uh, legislators, you know, uh, chairs of the economic advisory under Republican presidents. And a form of the carbon tax is also appealed to you know, libertarians and conservatives when you return the carbon tax as a dividend to all citizens. So do you think there's any potential for uh, some sort of bipartisan consensus on that? Unfortunately, I don't, not in the near future. I don't see that. Um, because the key, the key uh, thing about Republicans su who support carbon taxation is that they are former officials you don't see current officials supporting that approach. And the electoral incentives for Republicans right now are so strongly in opposition to climate policy, to environmental policy, and, and to taxation. So carbon taxation is really kind of, um, it's, it's a double whammy. It's, it's, ta it's a tax and it's, in, it's environmental or climate policy. And uh, those are both rather toxic to the Republican base. Um, so I think generally, uh, Probably emissions trading has a better chance in the U.S. than carbon taxation. You can see that in California uh, and the, the regional greenhouse gas initiative in the Northeast have emissions trading, um, but we don't have a carbon tax at, any, at the state level in anywhere in the United States. It's failed twice by referendum in Washington state. So if it can't pass in Washington state, I don't think it can pass in Washington, D.C. at this time.
Hi, my name is Shia Sarkowski. Um, I'm undeclared and I'm a freshman at CMC. So you mentioned that in response to kind of the great polarization that's happening right now on climate policy, Biden is including some nuclear energy proposals to kind of win over moderate Democrats and some conservatives. Can you elaborate on that and talk about those proposals and talk about more broadly how nuclear might be part of this play? I didn't quite get the last part of your question, but what, what was the last phrase? Um, just how nuclear might be uh, a greater factor in the future for climate change in yes, America. Yes, I see. Okay, yeah, about the future of, of nuclear power. So um, in terms of where, this, where it's embedded in this policy, I think what you see is the research and development spending and the proposals for a uh, clean energy standard or a clean energy performance plan. They all included nuclear power. It's considered carbon free or, you know, as nearly carbon free as it gets. And so um, they would be given advantage over fossil fuels. Um, so in terms of research and development, there's a number of what are called advanced nuclear um, projects that include smaller reactors and innovative technologies. Uh, so what about the future of nuclear power? I guess I'm more skeptical about that. If you look at what's happened in the last 10 years, uh, even as many states have been pressing uh, renewable energy policies, um, and that sector has been growing. Nuclear power has remained stagnant. There's been almost no new plants built in the last 10 years. There's very few planned. Um, the investment costs are enormous. Uh, the concerns about safety and waste disposal are still burdening the industry, uh, and they help to lead toward cost increases uh, because of measures that are taken to deal with them, uh, with safety anyway. So. Um, I don't see it as uh, an expanding share of U.S. electricity generation. I think that uh, probably it will be maintained. I think we'll probably see petitions to keep plants in operation longer uh, than their initial licenses. So I think that it won't decline, uh, at least not very much, over the next 10 or 20 years, but I don't see a, a major increase. Uh, the, the solution, I think, lies in what are called the new renewables, uh, mainly wind and solar biomass, and in energy efficiency. Hi, um, Lincoln Bernard, PPE major, uh, senior. So you talked a lot, oh, and thank you for the talk, by the way, great talk. Um, you talked a lot about how business has really shifted towards a pro-climate change mitigation um, sort of approach. Uh, the majority of Demogra Democrats are certainly uh, pro climate change mitigation. So what are the big political influences that are keeping a moderate Democrat or even a moderate Republican from uh, just not impeding uh, climate change mitigation policies? Yeah, thanks. I, 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 I wish I knew more about the answers. Like what, is it, what does Joe Manchin need? What does Kristen Sinema need? Um, I don't know the answer to that. Um, you know, I th obviously, Manchin has long represented the coal interests in West Virginia. Um, it was almost um, amazing to think that he could support climate policy given that. Um, so CCS is kind of a, you know, it's a lifeline or a fig leaf, depending on how you look at it, for the coal industry. Uh, so I could see, you know, uh, that potential there for him. Um, but. You know, I think that there's his, his, his constituents. I mean, politics is local. The, the con our, our Congress people are elected in states or in smaller districts. And so they are, uh, right now, I mean, under current conditions, they have relatively homogeneous districts. And so um, right now, someone like Manchin can, you know, if he, if he doesn't watch his step, he may not be reelected. So I think that his electoral incentives are operating there. I don't understand cinema much. That's been a big surprise to everybody, I think. Uh, her concerns seem to be mostly about, about taxation and about the deficit. Um, but, um, you know, if you, if you figure out the answer, if anybody does, let me know. Um, hello, uh, my name is Timothy. I'm a senior from Pomona. Um, I was wondering what you think made of the Biden administration's um, foreign climate policy, particularly regarding developing nations and sort of the trend of continuing to use coal in their growing economies? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a, it's, it's a difficult situation because um, 
you know, developing countries have strong arguments that they should be allowed to pollute as much as we did, um, and or at least per capita equal emissions. Um, so, and those that have access to cheap coal uh, would certainly like to use it, uh, India in particular. Uh, so, uh, Biden administration, like the rest of the um, pro-climate policy countries in the European Union, need to try to somehow convince them. And that convincing, they've, th those countries they've made clear, includes uh, financing through the, the Green Climate Fund. And uh, that, that fund is incredibly short of the money that is said to be needed. Uh, the, the over 10 years ago, uh, they said they would try to mobilize $100 billion per year. Uh, in the intervening 10 years, they've only mobilized a total of about $10 billion. That's about $1 billion per year. It's 1% of what they said they needed in order to get the developing countries uh, to transition. Uh, so there's this enormous gulf there, and I don't know what the solution is. Uh, I think that it's very small incremental steps at this point. And um, you know, China and its coal, its coal build out is a, perhaps an easier target, an easier thing to try to influence, even though it's not that easy to influence the Chinese government. Um, I, th I think that this gulf is going to continue, and I think that until some countries come up with some serious money, uh, th the developing countries are going to be skeptical. Hi, my name is Camille Malakova. I'm a sophomore studying economics at CMC. And I was wondering, how do you think that recent developments in Europe with energy shortages due to lower wind and solar levels will affect future policy in the states and throughout the world? Yeah, that's uh, um, another, another warning sign or problem. Uh, it's, it, there are short-term shortages right now and short-term price increases, and that is something that can perhaps be weathered. Uh, it's partly due to the recovery from the pandemic, uh, increasing demand very quickly, uh, partly to, to do with the supply of gas from Russia. Um, but there's a longer term problem there, which is that if these countries uh, try to act on their ambitious targets that they have been adopting, uh, that's, it may lead to shortages of energy uh, from if they're, really, if they're really trying to uh, meet those targets uh, by using renewables. Uh, if they don't come up with energy conservation, energy efficiency policies quickly enough, um, there's going to be that, that limiting factor, and they're going to find that they need to scale back their targets. Uh, and they either need to do that preemptively to, to, so that they don't wind up facing protests like the, the feared yellow vest protests in France uh, some years ago, or they will be subject to electoral backlash. Um, so it means that they have to tread carefully. The, 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 the household cost problem, the, the, the how climate policies increase household costs, is going to need increasing amount of attention. Uh, how do you find ways to compensate households? Up till now, a lot of Europe, Europe's climate policies have fallen more heavily on households, and they've, they've spared their industry. Uh, if you look at carbon taxes in Scandinavia, for example, Germany's ecological tax reform, um, that approach has, it has its limits. At some point, consumers will, uh, at the ballot box, push back against that. Uh, so th the distributional consequences of climate policy will need more attention than they've gotten so far. Hi, uh, my name is George Ashburn. I'm a freshman at CMC, a uh, prospective PPE major. Um, and thank you very much for the talk. Uh, my, my question for you is, there's been a, uh, the Supreme Court recently granted cert uh, to a challenge um, to EPA regulatory authority um, on, on climate issues, and there's been a lot of consternation about the potential implications of their decision for uh, environmental regular authority and even federal regular, uh, regulatory authority uh, broadly. So could you go into the details of that case and, and what you think the potential implications may be? Sorry, I can't go into detail on the case because I don't, I don't know the case, but maybe you can tell me the name of the case at least. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't remember the name of the case. Okay, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, this was, you know, um, something that has been on the agenda for quite a while now. I mean, the, the, the whittling away of the Chevron decision or the evading of it, um, it's, a, it's a little bit like what's going on in abortion rights, not to get off topic here, but uh, there, there are ways to undermine the Chevron decision without uh, actually 
avoiding it uh, by, by just using it less. Uh, so the, the courts are hostile to administrative authority and um, the, ex the exercise of it unilaterally. And um, I think what that means is that where business comes down on this is more important um, than ever, I'd say. I mean, it's always been important, but I think if you look at most important cases, um, if big business supported the uh, position, that's the, the federal courts would often find a way to accommodate it. And if biz business was unified and against it, then a different result could be found. Uh, so I think that's why the, the EPA is going to step carefully and it's, it's uh, the, the exact uh, stringency of its regulatory uh, standards now. Um, and, you know, big business doesn't like the uncertainty. Um, so the government and business sort of have an interest in common to try to reach some agreement, compromise uh, ahead of time. They don't, business doesn't really want to see rules adopted and then thrown out in court two years from now uh, because that, that inter interferes with their planning. Um, but thanks for the question then. Hi, my name is Claire Vlasis. I'm a freshman at CMC. My question for you is regarding the, the graph you showed about the solar panel dipping in price. Much of that is due to Chinese subsidization, right? Uh, I don't know how much is due to China's subsidies. It a lot of it has to do with uh, economies of scale. Um, so I don't think that this, if you, if you, even if you put in a generous amount there for for dumping or for state subsidies, uh, I don't, you wouldn't find that solar was um, more expensive than natural gas, I don't think. Um, but yeah, certainly, that, I mean, China has been a big, has become a big player in this market, yes. Well, considering China's large role, do you think that something like the Solyndra failure in the Obama administration might again play into Biden's policies? Well, I don't know. The Solyndra failure, that was a, a company that the U.S. invested in at just sort of the wrong time. I mean, they, they, they extended loan guarantees and it failed. And if you look at the total volume of loans that failed in that program, it was a very small percentage of the total. And so as far as industrial policy goes, it was not a really very, not, not an unsuccessful, it was a fairly successful industrial policy. Um, you know, I think that there's a bigger problem, which is the, the tariffs that the Trump administration slapped on solar imports from China, which is uh, constraining, to some extent, the, the expansion of solar in the United States. And the Biden administration has not changed that policy. Um, so yes, international trade figures into this, for sure. And um, it's, you know, it, it, the question is whether this matters just at the margins or whether it could be some, become something larger. Um, but the, um, you know, the overall trend here is, is, is very clear, and it's not just due to any one thing. It's not just to any, any one country. Uh, it has to, has to do with technological development and the size of markets. So I don't, I don't, I don't see it as a, as a major impediment, um, but we will hear about it because it matters for businesses. It matters in terms of the size of their profits and the, the scale at which they will be um, transitioning to solar. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah, thanks. Are there any more questions this evening from our student or faculty audience? Awesome. Hi, thank you for your talk. My name is Anna. I'm a senior at CMC. Uh, and I was just wondering, you know, accepting the fact that climate change is very real um, and a pressing threat, I'm wondering what you would say if you were speaking to one of Biden's climate advisors as like a single policy or, or top priority. <laughs> uh, I think I'd say, I'd ask a question that a student asked a while ago, do you know what mansion and cinema want? <laughs> <laughs> I think as a good social scientist, I would have questions rather than advice. Um, and I think that would be my first question really. and and. Um, yeah, I'd also want to know, like, you know, how are how are the negotiations going really with the car industry and with the with the oil and gas industry? You know, are, are they are they really are they willing to meet you somewhere in the middle, or do you think they want to they're going to stab you in the back? Um, Last sorry, question I don't, for sorry, I don't have a more substantive answer than that, but I think that's. Yeah. Hi, I'm Ari. I'm a senior majoring in PPE at CMC. Uh, one thing that I'm interested in your opinion on is 
the role of geoengineering in bipartisan climate uh, policy, and whether you think that that's something domestic or um, something even that's a, a possibility. You talked about carbon, uh, carbon capture, but I'm wondering about other uh, geoengineering projects and research as well. Right. Okay. Yeah. So um, it's not, it's not, um, it's not usually on our radar screen because it's such an underdeveloped policy area. Um, so I think it's something we're going to be hearing more about uh, in the next 10 years. But at this point, they haven't really reached a consensus on moving forward with research and development. Uh, and that's the next step for, for geoengineering. Uh, I'm thinking of, of the, the main approach, which is uh, sulfate aerosols, to put, to put um, sulfates in the atmosphere to block the sun's rays. Uh, and that seems to be the approach that has the most potential to act quickly. Uh, I think we will be hearing about that as we see that we're getting closer to one and a half degrees of Celsius, uh, as we see that we're locked into that. Um, but a couple things have to happen. One is we have to, uh, as a, each country that wants to be involved has to decide they, they're willing to, to go this route. And the other is that they have to coordinate and decide on some governance framework. Uh, because this is an area where, you know, e even if it, if it were to be successful at reducing global warming, it's going to have regional effects that are going to be negative in some areas, more drought or more flooding in some places. And uh, there's enormous potential there for, um, for countries to blame other countries if, you know, for having altered the climate. Um, because of that, I'm not sure that we're really going to go the geoengineering route, the sulfate aerosol route. Uh, direct air capture is, is a, I guess, a less problematic technology, but it's much farther away from a viability, I think. And it's also one that would operate much more slowly because it really re it means removing CO2 from the atmosphere, and that, can, that cannot be done that quickly, even in the best case scenario. Uh, whereas sulfate aerosols, within a small number of years, they could uh, help to reduce global temperature. Um, Please join me in thanking Professor Kirpin for his enlightening app talk.